Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our service of worship on this Sunday morning. We're going to start with a prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of all of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. In our service today, we are continuing to look at the book of Romans, and today the reading is from Romans chapter 7, a passage where Paul is lamenting about his own body and the struggles that he has had within himself and continues to have. Uh, it's quite a tricky reading, so because of that, I've asked Jan again this week to read this for me. So, Jan will read from Romans chapter 7. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer my, I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me for in my inner being i delight in god's law but i see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me what a wretched man i am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death thanks be to god who delivers me through jesus christ our lord And so we're going to be thinking this morning about that passage and we're going to try to apply that passage to our lives. And so before we go to the sermon this morning, let's have a short prayer. Heavenly Father, you promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst of them. Even though we are meeting online today and that we are apart, you are still here in the midst of us. Open our eyes to your glory and help us to know of the common life that we share in you. Strengthen us in faith, we pray. Amen. Amen. I wonder, have you ever said or done things that you went on then to regret? I know that I've done plenty of those things in my life, and some of those things, if I am honest, still have some sort of hold over me. They're is one thing in particular that I did in my life that still grieves me to this present day and it makes me feel terrible when I reflect upon it and I sometimes wonder oh what a terrible person I really am and I would love to go back and to redo those things in a different way but I can't. I wonder if you've gone through those particular things in your life. Well, as I reflect upon that one particular thing, I think I could repeat the words that St. Paul uses in today's reading, where he says, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? I wonder if you've ever had those sorts of thoughts. Well, as I reflect upon my life and think about the things that I've done that I've regretted, I think Paul also was reflecting upon his life and regretting many of the things that he had done, not least persecuting the church. He was a bystander when Stephen was martyred and became the first martyr of the Christian church. We can read about it in Acts chapter 8. In that particular chapter, Paul is called Saul and he stands to one side looking after the coats of those who are stoning Stephen and so he looks on 
as this Christian man becomes the first martyr of the church. Romans chapter 7 then is a lamentation. Here Paul is lamenting. He is saying and reflecting upon his life and telling us that he sometimes does the things that he does not want to do and he does the things that he hates. In fact, he doesn't do the good that he wants to do, but the evil which he doesn't want to do. And then he reflects upon this in the light of the law, the law which meant so much to him. Remember, this Paul, who was previously called Saul, was brought up as a strict Jew. And in his letter to the church in Philippi, in Philippi St Paul describes himself and his background. And these are the words that he uses to describe himself. He says, if anyone has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. This was a man who could describe himself as being faultless in regard to the Old Testament law. And just think upon that reflection there that Paul writes about himself. He was circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, the most conservative of the Jewish tribes, a member of the Pharisees, somebody who had the strictest interpretation of the law. And that law was the thing that brought him forgiveness throughout his life until he met with Jesus. But Paul knew that the law was contrary to his body. In fact, the things that he did in his body were the things that brought him to sin. That would have been very evident to him when he reflected upon things such as the Ten Commandments. He would have been meticulous in trying not to break those commandments, but of course his actions very often led to the fact that he did break those commandments. And he struggled. He realised that this constant struggle within himself was to do with the law having a hold over him. The body held him back. This body is a sinful body and it does sinful things. Even to Paul as a Christian, he reflected upon the past and those things one would say was holding him back. Again, if I'm going to be truly honest, I think what Paul is describing here is possibly you and me. He's describing all of us because we so often struggle to do that which is right. And in fact, we very often do the opposite. We go and do wrong. And that wrong can and often does have a hold over us. Now, Paul was lamenting all the things that had a hold over him in that reading today. But he does finish on a high note. And that high note is the fact that, G that Paul then goes to point to the person of Jesus. He says this, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the very end of that reading. And then if we go on to Romans chapter eight, Paul expands a little bit more of what knowing Jesus means for him. In fact, Romans 8 and in verse 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So in this part of the Bible, in Romans 7, Paul realises that his body and the Old Testament law condemns him. What he does, his actions, still can condemn him, even though he's a Christian. But the good news is that Jesus brings us justification. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful verse. And it's a pity, really, that today's reading didn't go on to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. So here was Paul 
struggling when looking back. And I think Paul is giving us here a picture of what discipleship is like. This is his discipleship. He is still on that journey. Paul is still a work in progress. We think of Paul as being the great apostle to the Gentile world, and of course he was. But even Paul was a work in progress. The Archbishop of Canterbury is a work in progress. Dare I say it, even the Pope is a work in progress when it comes to our relationship with God. We are all of us like clay on the potter's wheel, where Jesus is the potter. And you know, he is working at us and sometimes those things that we reflect upon can be so painful. But it's only when we do work through those things that we actually learn and we can grow and move on. There is a, a book written by the Franciscan monk and Roman Catholic priest, Father Richard Raw, called The Divine Dance. And in that book, Richard Raw talks about the Trinity, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and how they relate to each other. And he uses the picture of a dance, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit are dancing together. They are in this relationship. And there is a part in the book where Father Richard Raw talks about our, our discipleship, our walking with God, and the fact that God invites us to take part in the Trinity, to take part in the divine dance. He says to us, are you dancing? And we say, are you asking? And God says, I'm asking. And then do we make the decision? Yes, I'm dancing. The trouble is that when we then start to dance with God, things crop up that trip us up. We learn to dance with God. Sometimes it doesn't come easy. And of course, we need to know the moves. We need to know where God is taking us. We need to listen to God. We need to have our eyes open to God. And as we go through our Christian discipleship, things become a little bit clearer at times. But it's still our body that holds us back. It's the sin that can sometimes get in the way. But I think it's therefore important that we are reminded of what Paul goes on to remind himself and his readers about in Romans chapter 8. There is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And if you read through Romans chapter 8, towards the end of the reading there, Paul is describing the world in which people were living and Rome at the time was a very uncertain place. Very much like the world today. We do not know where things are going to go from one moment to the other. There were problems with food, problems with war, violence, civil disobedience. Governments didn't really know what they were doing. I'm not going to push that one too much today. But the world hasn't changed a great deal over the years. The truth is that God hasn't changed much either. It's the same God who was there today. And at the end of that reading, Paul reminds people that in the uncertainties of the world, we can be sure of the certainty of God. And so I'm going to take you now from this reading in Romans chapter 7 to the end of Romans chapter 8. Again, a great past part of the Bible that I love. Paul says this. He's just described the world and all its uncertainties. And he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor anything else in the whole of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And, you know, as I reflect upon those things that I regret in my life, the only thing that can give me encouragement to go forward is to know that God doesn't condemn me. I might condemn myself, and sometimes rightly so if we're doing wrong things, but God offers love and forgiveness. And thereby, of course, he gives us another picture, another metaphor for us to apply to our lives, that if we are forgiven by God, we also ought to forgive and seek the forgiveness of others. So God is saying to us today, 
Are you dancing? Perhaps we're saying, are you asking? God is saying, I'm asking. So are we dancing? If you do want to dance with God, it can sometimes be quite difficult. It sometimes can be quite tricky. We can sometimes feel very guilty for the things that we've done in the past. But God picks us up and he points us forward. As he did with Paul, so he will do with you and with me. Let us try not to do the things that we do not want to do and to do the things that we want to do. But let's dance with God. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are, who are loved by you, those who are in you. Help us to know your forgiveness in our lives and to reflect that forgiveness when we meet with our friends and families and other people. Amen. And so as we ask God to help us to become more like Jesus, let us receive his forgiveness. And as we go into the world, seek to reflect his love more and more each day. So may the Lord forgive us. May the Lord bless us. And as we go into this world, may the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit always be with us. Amen. For our intercessions this morning, since we're using video, I'm going to use some pictures behind the words. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are faithful and steadfast, that in our ever-changing and uncertain world, you are our security and you never change. As the lockdown eases and behaviour changes, we pray for those who are struggling with fear, anxiety, stress, depression and loneliness in connection with coronavirus. May you be for them a strong tower, a hiding place and a refuge. As these pictures remind us of political change and violence in the past, we pray for situations of unrest around the world. We particularly remember the citizens of Hong Kong and the Uyghur Muslims as they face repression from China. We remember the struggle between Israelis and Palestinians and the continuing debates around racism and policing in America and the UK. Strengthen and stand with those who suffer, Lord, and bring your peace, justice and lasting change for good. Fig trees in the Bible symbolise well-being and flourishing. So let's take a moment to pray for the health and well-being of people we know. You may want to pause the video to give yourself more time. And so to close, a Celtic prayer of blessing. The Father of many resting places grant you rest. The Christ who stilled the storm, grant you calm. The Spirit who fills all things, grant you peace. God's light be your light. God's love be your love. God's way be your way. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and always. Amen.